Now my microphone's on. It's always a trick, finding the on switch, which is hidden down in here, and people think you're having a gallbladder attack when you reach for it. Okay, are we good to go? From New Testament times, Christians have gathered on Sunday, the first day of the week, to give thanks for our creation and for redemption in Jesus Christ, and to continue the practice of sharing the body and blood of Christ instituted by Jesus at the Last Supper. Writer Dorothy Sayers called this gathering the greatest drama ever staged. When I was preparing to go to seminary at age 40, I had breakfast with a wonderful bishop, Daniel Corrigan. He was one of the three bishops who illegally ordained the first women priests in the Episcopal Church, known as the Philadelphia Eleven, before the National Church had approved it. He looked across the breakfast table at me and said, well, what's your story, kid? I didn't feel much like a kid, but compared to him, I guess I was. I told him about my years in show business in Hollywood, and I said, Bishop, don't you think it's a little weird to go from showbiz to the priesthood? And he said, hell no, honey, it's all drama if you do it right. <laughs> but now you've got a better script. We call this high drama the Eucharist from the Greek word for Thanksgiving. Our script is from the Book of Common Prayer and the Holy Bible. Our sacred drama has two acts, the Word of God and the Holy Communion. Today I will be doing commentary on Act One, if you want act two, you have to come back next Sunday. As in any drama, there is first a set to decorate. Churches may have artwork on the walls, stained glass windows, icons of saints, various hangings, and these change with the season. There may be flowers and so on, things to remind us of the beauty of God's creation the colors of the set decoration and the clergy vestments change with the change in church seasons. The Episcopal Church, like the Roman Catholic Church, begins the church year four Sundays before Christmas with the first Sunday of Advent, a season, season which is traditionally either purple or more commonly now, the serum blue that we use here. Vanna, come on. I have my own Vanna White. Then comes the Christmas season. Season, it's not a day. Christmas is a season, and it's white. The Christmas season ends with the Epiphany, January 6th, and the arrival of the so-called wise men. The short season of Epiphany, which we're in right now, is green, which is why the vestments and the hangings are all green. It is followed by Lent, during which we go purple, the season, the color of passion. Lent is a season of penitence, which leads us into Holy Week. Passion Sunday, or <clears throat> Palm Sunday, begins several days of red vestments and decor, until we go black, bare, on Good Friday, and then a blast of white for Easter, which, by the way, is also not a day, it's a season, lasting until the Feast of Pentecost, 50 days later, which is red, voila, and followed by what's called ordinary time, or the season after Pentecost which is, frankly, the longest green season in the history of the world, until we come around again to the first Sunday of Advent. Now, green being this very long season of ordinary time can get a little boring color-wise, and I'm easily bored. So a few years back, my friends Becky and Marty Benson had a stole made for me for the green season 
but with a little variety in it to keep me alert. Along with the set decoration, there must be costumes for the drama. Behold the cassock, the basic black dress of clergy. Until the 1960s, this was the common vestment of male clergy. Well, all the clergy were male. The word means long coat worn over one's clothes. And it is sometimes split from the waist down the back for easy mounting of your horse, which you will ride to church. <laughs> Most of our costuming evolved from Roman dress-up clothes, originally worn not just in worship, but on the streets as well. The Anglican cassock is double-breasted and fastens on the shoulder. And it is usually made out of polyester and is a lot like wearing an oven. Mine is a Roman Catholic cassock, which buttons to the floor and is 100% cotton. Atop the cassock, one wears a surplice, not surplus, surplice, which comes in varying lengths, or it's must much shorter curtain. The kata. You can see this is not Vanna White. This is a very reluctant model. <laughs> Though these were once costumes for clergy only, in churches with large staff, you will now see many of these outfits on acolytes, lectors, and lay assistants, and choir members as well. And when Holly is up here, I'll have her show you her sleeves, which are very special. Oh, she's here. Show us your sleeves. A special version for the organist who can get her arms out of those white angel robes. <laughs> Yay! But in the case of clergy, this is all costuming for a non-Eucharistic event, like morning prayer or a wedding or funeral, where communion isn't happening. For the Eucharist, the ordained players may wear, as I do, what is called an alb, complete with a cincture, or girdle, as in gird your loins when you come before the Lord. The stole, the symbol of the yoke of Christ, as in take my yoke upon you. And in most churches, the celebrant will wear atop the alb a chasuble, voila, which comes from the Latin word casula, <laughs> She's very modest. <laughs> Chasuble means casula, little house, for obvious reasons. Once the stage is set by the altar guild and the costumes are all in place, we gather the cast for this high drama. There is usually a call to worship, a prelude, either provided by the organist or by the bell choir or other musicians. This is not meant as background music for our conversation. I can't underscore that enough. The prelude is a time for us to gather and sit in personal silence, preparing ourselves for what is about to happen. It's our transition from the world out there to the sacred space in here. And every church musician I've ever known considers both the prelude and the postlude as their offering of prayer on behalf of the body of Christ. So let us be prayerful as we begin our worship.
Since this is a celebration, the person who presides over the action is called the celebrant. But it takes more than a celebrant to put on this celebration, especially in larger churches. When my home diocese of Los Angeles celebrated its 100th birthday, we filled the LA Convention Center with 30,000 Episcopalians on Pentecost morning. There wasn't one entrance procession, there were three, coming from three different directions and meeting in the middle, each one led by a verger with his wand to keep the riffraff away, censers throwing smoke, acolytes waving long flexible fishing poles with long red banners on them that whipped overhead. And then the pr processional cross and the torches, the lay readers, baptismal candidates, deacons, priests, and at the end of each procession, a bishop. It was quite a dramatic performance. The preacher for that occasion was the Archbishop of Canterbury. My friend Michael Cunningham and I were privileged to direct the drama from the middle of the room wearing enormous headsets. This was the 90s. They weren't little invisible things like this. Now usually the sacred drama is a much simpler affair. But however it's staged, this drama is our worship from the English word worthship the way we show what or who we deem worthy of our praise. We call it liturgy from another Greek word, liturgia, which means the work of the people. Our liturgy, this work we do together, is one of worship and mission. In worship, we face toward God, representing the world to God in thanksgiving and prayer. In mission, we face outward, representing God to the world in joyful service. To refer to what we do here as a worship service is actually redundant because for us, worship is service and service is worship. Now all this we do, but the great high priest who truly presides at this and every celebration is Jesus. Christ takes our dramatic action and unites it with God's eternal act of self-offering or oblation made once and for all time on the altar of the cross. And so act one is the liturgy of the word, which usually begins with some entrance rite or procession to get all the players into their places. The procession may be led by a verger, and we have one. A role that began in the Middle Ages as the protector of the procession, leading the ceremonial officials into the church from the town square. With his mace, he would literally clear the path if necessary. He may be followed by a thurifer, swinging the thurible with smoking incense, this also goes back to the ancient processions, the streets and towns, as well as the people milling about, simply did not smell very good, and incense covered the aromas of the crowd. But in religious ceremony, incense goes way back to our Jewish roots, and it's often mentioned in Hebrew scriptures. Then comes the cross and torches, the acolytes, which literally means light bearer. Here, as in many churches now, the verger doesn't have to beat back the crowd and the animals, and so the procession is led by the cross and torches. The choir, the lay readers, additional clergy, and last, the celebrant. Unless the bishop is present, the bishop always comes last to signify that he or she is first among equals. So places please, as you are able, please stand and cue the opening hymn.
At this time, the children are invited to attend Children's Chapel. Once the players are in place, the entrance rite continues with an opening acclamation chosen to reflect the season of the church year. It continues with the collect for purity in which we ask the Holy Spirit to inspire us so that we may worship with our whole hearts. After the song of praise, a prayer that collects our thoughts and intentions of the day, appropriately called the collect of the day. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be your kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now we are ready for the main portion of Act One, the Word of God, proclaimed through readings from the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament. The early church borrowed and expanded the format from the traditional Jewish synagogue practice of daily scripture reading, study, and prayer. We hear the story of our ancestors in the faith. This is both our story and God's story. The readings are prescribed in a three-year lectionary cycle, so over any three-year period, if you're in church every week, you will hear much of both the Old and the New Testaments. From the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, we hear the record of God's relationship with his chosen people, Israel. This helps us to understand something of our own Jewish heritage, 
we are reminded of our roots and those of Jesus in Judaism by the reading and singing of a psalm from the ancient worship of Israel. Pain and sorrow, repentance and cries for help, praise to God and joy in creation are all brought together in this collection of Jewish worship songs we call the Psalter, the Book of Psalms. In our liturgy, these may be read or chanted. The second reading is from the New Testament, usually from the epistles, which are letters sent to the earliest Christian congregations, telling how Jesus' earliest followers understood the good news that Jesus had preached and how they applied it in their own individual situations. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> A reading from the book of Isaiah. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. The word of the Lord.
a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gifts as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you are called into fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel climaxes our reading of scripture. We believe that Jesus is with us in the proclamation of his good news, which is what the word gospel means. In the early church, the gospel book was carried from the altar to the pulpit to enact the coming of the good news to the people of God, which is why we now process the gospel into the congregation, to remind us that God came to us and dwelt in our midst. And because the gospel is the story of God's ultimate revelation in Jesus Christ, we stand to praise the God whose gift it is. The reading of the gospel may be preceded and or followed by a hymn called The Gradual. And the short proclamations of glory and praise to Christ that we speak before and after the reading are meant to help us make our listening an act of real worship, reminding us that Christ is present in the reading of the good news. Before the reading, you may see the custom of making the sign of the cross with the thumb on the forehead, on the lips, and over the heart, saying, may Christ and his gospel be in my mind, on my lips, and in my heart. Normally, the gospel is followed by a sermon or homily, which combines the message of the lessons, current events, the life of the preacher and the congregation, and hopefully, inspiration from God. First we listen, then we are encouraged or exhorted by the sermon to become the best disciples we can be. The sermon has been eliminated from today's gospel, so we can do this commentary. So now let us listen to the good news of Jesus Christ, not just with our ears, but with our hearts and minds as well. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me 
because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. the sermon, which normally happens here, we stand and publicly affirm what we believe, the basic bottom line of Christianity, as outlined in the Nicene Creed, which was first given form in the fourth century at the Church Council of Nicaea, from which it takes its name. It's an expansion of the earlier Apostles' Creed. This first ecumenical church council was convened in Nicaea, Turkey, by none other than the Emperor Constantine, seeking to achieve a consensus on the basics of Christian belief, especially to achieve agreement on the nature of Christ. The Council argued for a long time whether the Father and the Son were homoousius or homoousius, which is homo, same, usia, stuff, substance, beingness, or add an I, homoi, usia, it's almost but not quite the same stuff. Well, same stuff won the day. So we say the Father and the Son are of one being, or the Father, the Son is of one substance with the Father. Over time, the Nicene Creed was revised and refined, and in the fifth century was made the Creed of the Eucharist in all of Christendom. So the pattern here is to hear and reflect on the word of God, to stand up and say what we believe, and then to say our prayers. In our baptismal covenant, we promise with God's help to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in the prayers. 
In his letter to the early church, St. James wrote, Are any of you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any of you sick? They should be prayed over and anointed in the name of the Lord. For the prayer of the faithful will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. So the prayers of the people in our corporate worship is our beseeching God to intervene on our behalf in the here and now of everyday life. Our prayer book allows for great flexibility regarding the form and focus of our corporate prayers. There are always prayers for the members of the congregation and for mission of the church throughout the world, for the nation and all in authority, for the welfare of the world and the concerns of the local community. We include intercessions for all who suffer or are in trouble, for those who have died, and we give thanks for the blessings of our lives. Our corporate prayers may be entirely formal, using one of the forms set forth in the Book of Common Prayer, or they may be drawn from other sources selected by the clergy. Sometimes members of a congregation will write a whole new version for that parish. But formal or informal, the prayers are intended for us to ask that God's power come to life in us so that our lives and those of others may be lived in wholeness and to the glory of God. Let us stand and say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified on the Pontius He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For prayers of the people, you are invited to remain standing or to sit or kneel as you prefer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, Melody, our associate rector, and Jay, John, Marnie, Gwyneth, and Israel, our affiliated clergy. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, especially Joe, our president, Glenn, our governor, and Bobby, our mayor. Give us grace to do your will in all that we may undertake. That our words may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light perpetual shine on them. 
We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. On our short-term prayer list, Gabriel, Laura, the Wiley family, the Best family, Paul, Roman, Laura, and Latane, Mike and Lynn, Amber, Priscilla, Jim and Beth, Barbara and Betty. On our long-term prayer list, George, Mike, Jim and Karen, Alexander, Emily and Dave, Ben and Lynn, Jennifer and Aaron, Jerry, Brock, Chevy, Ed and Jim and Lou Ann. For our deployed military, Jessica Wilder and Chris Meyer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Having gathered, heard, and reflected on God's word, and responded by affirming what we believe and saying our prayers, we now confess our sins in a public group confession of the ways we have fallen short of our calling. This was never intended to replace private, individual confession called reconciliation of a penitent, which is found elsewhere in the prayer book. After the priest pronounces God's forgiveness in the absolution, we exchange the kiss of peace. This is the part where my brother Bill used to always look at me and say, is this where the strangers come up and hug you? <laughs> I don't think he quite got it. It expresses our love for and recognition of one another as actors in the drama of our salvation. We greet one another with a handshake or an embrace or a kiss. Peace is not really a word of greeting or welcome here. It is our exchange of the indwelling and transcendent Christ within each one of us. In the early church, an unwillingness to exchange the peace with fellow parishioners would disqualify you from receiving communion. As sinners, forgiven, and redeemed, we are exchanging and acknowledging the shalom of God, the peace and wholeness that passes all human understanding. And we are reminded of Jesus' injunction in the Sermon on the Mount, first be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift at the altar. The peace acts like a hinge tying together the two acts of our sacred drama. In this context, to say peace be with you is a sacred bestowing upon one another the grace of God, the peace of Christ, not to be confused with the coffee hour or a social greeting. Comments and conversation are really not appropriate during the exchange of the peace. After the peace, there is a pause in the dramatic action a time for us to bring the story of our own local parish with announcements and blessings before the crowd. We highlight various parish and community events, pieces of our own story in this church. All this before we gather at the Lord's table for act two of our drama, which we will talk more about next week. Reverend Melody. And now at the top of page 11 in your bulletins, as you are able, you are invited to either stand or sit or kneel as we move into the confession of sin. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, we want to thank Reverend Marnie Schneider for that brilliant session of part one of our order of service. As she said, she will be back again next week to do part two, which starts with the Holy Eucharist. So thank you. Did y'all learn something new today? Anyone learn anything new? I did. I did. All right. Um, some really good news from our community. Those of you who know Allison Johnson, uh, just this week, she was officially granted postulancy in the Diocese of Southern Virginia. So when you see her, please give her a hug and give her a thumbs up. This has been a long time coming. Um, Allison had started this process to become a transitional deacon. Or no, a vocational. Sorry, not transitional. Unless that was the word. I don't know. Vocational deacon in the Episcopal Church. And... Um, Part of that, she started that process before COVID, so it's been a very long time, and um, we're just absolutely thrilled for her. And so now she begins the education part of that, and God willing, and the people consenting about two years or so from now, she'll be ordained a deacon. So please do keep her and this process that she has entered in your prayer. Um, also, please add to your prayers our vestry will go on retreat this coming weekend, so Friday night and Saturday, and spending some time together in prayer and in discernment and learning how to be a vestry together and especially during this time of transition. So please do keep your senior warden, Sarah Catherine Kibler, who has jumped in and has taken the reins, is doing an amazing job, and please keep all of your vestry members in prayer. If you turn to page 19, you will see pretty much the rest of our announcements and services coming up in the coming weeks. Um, our adult forum has kicked off, and this morning we heard from Debbie Quam, who started our presentation on discerning the voice of God, um, which was kind of kicked off from sermon from last week. Um, please do come next Sunday. Brother Andrew is going to be sharing about um, religious orders, and next Sunday in the Episcopal Church, we've um, they've designated January. 22nd to be Religious Order Sunday. That's when we talk about different monastic orders that actually do exist in the Episcopal Church. It's not just the Catholic Church that's got some monastic stuff. So if you'd like to learn more about that, please come to Adult Forum next Sunday. And if you enjoyed our presentation, those of us who went on the pilgrimage to the Holy Land gave a presentation in November about our trip. We only got about halfway through because Y'all were having a good time and asking lots of questions, which was great, and we wanted you to do that, but we ran out of time, so we scheduled part two for the end of this month. So please do come and join us. That is all the announcements I have, save for our offices are closed for tomorrow in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. Lift up. and a good and joyful thing, always and every to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to his, your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Alleluia. Christ.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Be seated.
In the name of this congregation, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, because we all share one bread, one cup. God's blessings and peace be upon you as you this year today. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, remain with you, and continue to illumine you by word and sacrament. Amen. Amen. Come back next week for part two, and now go in peace to love and serve the Lord.